he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the light of my life. With whom shall I be afraid? For we know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle shall be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her, for her husband. You may be seated. O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. program will continue as is printed. We ask that each person giving tributes will limit your comments regarding time per the family's request. At this time we shall have the prayer by Reverend Paul Smith. He would come.
attributes and comments can be given even from the lector, lectern to my right or the lectern to my left. Death is the worst thing that can happen to us. We lose the zest for living. I think it is very clear that George Haley had a zest for life, and he lived that way. Let us pray. In the quietness of this moment, in the beauty of this day, We gather with family and friends to give our blessings, our love, and our friendship with your servant, George Haley. Come, Lord Jesus, and welcome George into your heavenly kingdom. Open up the doors as he enters and receive him with shouts of hallelujahs. Be with Doris, David, and Anne, and all the other family members who not only mourn but rejoice for the life that their father and husband live, for the many ways in which you have touched their lives and the lives of those gathered here. We give you thanks. So Apollinaire says to us, George, come to the edge. George says, it's too high. The angel again says, George, come to the edge. George replies, I might fall. And one more time, the angel says, George, come to the edge. And George comes, and he looks over. The angel pushes him, and he flies. Fly, George. Keep flying. Amen. Psalm chapter 24, verses 3 to 6. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob.
those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your light. Winter and springtime and hot. 
Kelly, David, Ann, Ren, Brown, the seven grandchildren. I bring you greetings and blessings from Morehouse College. I knew Ambassador Haley for 15 years. I knew about him first. He was one of the most luminous Morehouse graduates. He stood above most in the Morehouse firmament. We worship together at People's Community Baptist Church, and I always felt his support, whether in the pulpit there or at the White House, where I would then move, next move, and, and or at Morehouse College. He was always supportive. I got to know Ren Brown first, and I'm sure he was proud to have a a Morehouse man as his son-in-law, because Ren Brown is about as close to a Morehouse man as you can get without being one. <laughs> Great friends for many years. I want to say three things about him in the two minutes that I have. I want you to know, I want you all to know that he was an authentic uh, Morehouse man. At Morehouse today, we talk about five things, acuity, supreme intelligence. He was that. We should be a man of integrity. His integrity was obvious. We should be a man of agency. Live on purpose, live intentionally. He did that. A man of brotherhood is number four. I used to see him at our reunions. He was class of 49, I was cl I'm class of 79, and he was in the Morehouse Brotherhood through and through. And uh, the fifth, be a man of consequence. George Haley was all of that, a man of integrity, acuity, agency, brotherhood, and consequence. I was pleased when I arrived and saw the, the little brochure back there, pamphlet um, of the Reader's Digest article that appeared, written by Alex Haley. I, I would that you all read it, read it again. Very, very powerful. A statement and it captures I think the reason why so many of us at Morehouse looked up to him and will continue to look up to him because he blazed a trail so the second thing I want to say about him he was a trailblazing Morehouse man my mind went back as I thought about this reading it again to a moment uh, among the most poignant moments on on television, live television, when in 1989, Michael Jackson sang a tribute to Sammy Davis Jr., who blazed the trail, and he sang these words, you were there before we came, you took the hurt, you took the shame, they built the walls to block your way, but you beat them down, you won the day, it wasn't right, it wasn't fair, but you taught them well, you made them care. And now we're here, and thanks to you, there's now a door we all walk through. And we are here for all to see, to be the best that we can be. Yes, I am here because you were there. George Haley was that kind of man. He blazed a trail. He took the slings and arrow, arrows, he took the insults, and made a way not just a way out of no way, he made a pathway out of no way. And then finally, <coughs> I want you all to know that Ambassador Haley was a second Timothy Morehouse man. And what that means is that he fought a good fight. He finished the course and he kept the faith. And in our language, nothing more is required and nothing less will do. Now at this moment, I would like to ask all Morehouse men in the house to please stand on your feet, all graduates of Morehouse. Amen.
Most notably, David, uh, we as Morehouse men want the Haley family to know and want you all to know that his legacy and his life are safe at Morehouse College. God bless you. Pastor, members of the clergy, Doris, David, Ann, Wren, and the grandchildren, ladies and gentlemen, George Williford Boris Haley was not born in Arkansas. Henning, Tennessee is the place of law and the site of those drawstrings of birth <coughs> that warrant the claim as the place he first called home. Place is said to be space plus memories, and Arkansas appropriately fits that definition as a place with space plus memories. Memories of youth shared with his brother Alex at the old J.C. Corbin School on the campus of Arkansas AM&N College, now the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, where their father, Professor Simon A. Haley, was dean of the Department of Agriculture. Little Rock, where over the years and especially after 1973, Attorney Haley, himself a veteran, would visit Little Rock National Cemetery, where his father, Professor Haley, a World War II veteran is buried, actually about 500 yards from the burial site of my own grandfather, Salone Slater, a World War II veteran. Arkansas, strong, enduring ties, a place with space plus memories. Years after his college days at Atlanta's Morehouse College, with intellectually driven and hardworking classmates among them, a young Martin Luther King Jr., under the tutelage of Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, and years before his sojourn to Kansas City, Kansas in 1952, where he would be smitten <laughs> by one of South been Indiana's beautiful and talented and caring Moxley girls, Doris, to whom he would become betrothed and pledge a lifetime of devotion over 60 years. <laughs> and they would beget Anne and David and they, with their beloved, would continue the legacy. And before his work there in Kansas City, as a young, newly minted lawyer who would become a part of Attorney Thurgood Marshall's legal defense team in the historic Brown v. Board of Education case, he would choose, before all of that, to trot the meandering and sometimes stony road to Fayetteville, Arkansas, to enroll as the third African American to enter the University of Arkansas School of Law. He would follow Silas Hunt and Jackie Shropshire. He would precede Wiley A. Branton, George Howard Jr., Christopher Columbus, C.C. Mercer, and collectively, they would come to be known as the Six Pioneers. Now, while some might have wondered about the impact of the admission to the law school of Haley and the other members of the Six Pioneers, would they fit in? Would their presence adversely affect the reputation of the Arkansas Law School and the university as the first public Southern school to admit African Americans? 
Well, with the day of destiny, having come to Attorney Haven, the last surviving member of the six pioneers, and with the somber declaration, it is finished. We can acknowledge that from Ambassador Haley and the six pioneers, we had trusted advisors to presidents, six to be exact. An ambassador, a federal judge, dean of the renowned Howard University School of Law, counselor and advisors to Archon Ernest Green and the other members of the Little Rock Nine, partners in major law firms, select practitioners, public and private sector leaders of note, high moral character, legal and business acumen and prowess at the local, state, and national levels. We therefore, gratefully and admiringly, and righteously acknowledge that Attorney Haley and the six pioneers acquitted themselves admirably. The reputation of the law school was actually enhanced. And Arkansas, and yes, the nation and the world were made better because they lived, because they were willing to step into the breach, and because they dedicated themselves to living lives of purpose and joy and consequence. Last November, Ambassador and Mrs. Haley made their last trip together to Arkansas to attend the 25th anniversary of the Wiley A. Branton Legal Symposium, sponsored by the National Bar Association and the University of Arkansas. The Haley's were honored guests, celebrated by the University of Arkansas Chancellor David Gerhardt, law school dean Stacy Leeds, and former dean Cynthia Nance, and hundreds gathered. Mr. Haley was actually recognized for his scholarship while in law school, having been selected the comments editor of the Arkansas Law Review in 1951. It was also the last time that two mutually supportive families got together. Two longtime and dear friends had a quiet and yet stirring moment together. Two friends, George Williford Boris Haley and Professor Stanley Miller Williams. One black, one white. A fact worth noting only because theirs was a friendship forged in the segregated South, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, to be exact, years before Brown years before the Central High Crisis. I doubt that either in the early 1950s could have imagined that things would change so much that in the 1990s, a native son of Arkansas, President William Jefferson Clinton, would ask one, Professor Williams, to serve as his poet laureate during his second inaugural, and the other, Attorney Haley, to return to the land of Kunta Kinte as, UN, or as U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of the Gambia, Arkansas, a place, a space, plus memory. Faith, family, and friends are said to represent true fortune and wealth in life. In this sense, George Williford Boris Haley was a very wealthy man. And because he embraced the biblical admonition that much is required of those to whom much is given, he made us, each and every one of us, richer for having known him. It is said that King David served the purpose of God in his generation. Ambassador George Williford Boris Haley did the same in his as we, and more importantly,
importantly, God and the angels can attest thereto. was handed out here this morning about the article that appeared on him as the man who never gave up is a very accurate description of the man who I knew. The man who served with me, we both went in together in a, in a class of 40 Kansas senators, 24 new senators were elected, Democrat and Republican. George and I were from adjacent counties. I was from Leavenworth and he from Wyandotte, Kansas City. We had the distinction of he being obviously the dapper gentleman he was and me being the youngest, one of the youngest legislators to be elected to the Kansas legislature. I'm deeply honored this morning to have been asked to just say a couple of things about my colleague. No question we all know he was a leader and he led in the Kansas Senate the Bill of Rights effort to establish fair housing in Kansas in the 60s, when you can imagine was not the most popular uh, challenge to be taking on in the Midwest state of Kansas. But I saw in him my colleague, a man who was committed to the service of those less fortunate, those abused, those neglected, and yes, those discriminated against. And if he were here with us this morning and could speak to us, he would say, I'm convinced to continue to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, while still reminding us still reminding us in the words of Thurgood Marshall at his funeral, that the battle is not over, the victory not won. We need to be ever vigilant to fight on until justice rolls down like water and righteousness a mighty stream. All of us must be thankful for this man who indeed never gave up. And while we mourn his passing, nor no token of sorrow, no vain memorials are necessary to celebrate both his distinguished public life and quiet private strengths and qualities that we know we all loved and will miss. We thank you, Senator George, for your legacy of family and friendship, love and caring, crusading and leading. The light of your voice is stilled, but your message still lives. Let us all commit ourselves to not let it die.
morning, Wadoli Doris, Anne and Ellie. And we, we assemble here today this morning to pay tribute to a leader, someone I refer to as the last living forest priest in the African forest, His Excellency Ambassador George Bush. We often refer to him as His Excellency for his graceness and wonderful demeanor. And he has been a great mentor, a great father, to so many of us that one can even count. I think this wonderful August Christine will be just too small, modest, the number, the countless number of children he's mentored over his impressive life. Ambassador Haley was always very concerned about his communities on both sides of the Atlantic always concerned about the next generations and always ready to exercise the most important of all virtue, courage. He was a courageous man. As a man of few words, his courage over the years was measured by the myriad of action that he took, decision he made. You just heard about the Fair Housing Bill in the 60s in these nations. His actions were seen, not proclaimed. His courage was felt, not heard. Sometimes, as often said, still water run deep. And that was the hallmark of Ambassador Haley's leadership, our excellence. Yes, as a great strategist and multi-generational leaders, with deep knowledge of history, he will be the first to recognize that, yes, mistakes were made here and there sometimes strategic mistakes, consequential ones. But he will never venture into the realm of complacency, even when, as a nation, we're drifting towards an institutional culture of whiners. He will remain always above the fray. Yes, in his word, originality and uniqueness were, in many ways, perfect attribute of leadership. That's his excellency. And on leadership, we learn so much from that wonderful leader. He taught us the true meaning of leadership, the courage to transcend the challenge of the past and the difficulty of the present, and to focus on the big picture, and the courage to always do the right thing to your community, and to know that the best time to do the right thing is always now. In fact, in essence, was very much conscious that opportunity is highly time sensitive. He was the man of actions. Leadership, in his view, was also the capacity to bridge across generations, to build bridges across generations. And even though we were never talked by the legendary Benny May, as you heard earlier, he became our teacher and professor, of course, through our mentor and leader highly inspirational Ambassador George Haley. His Excellency George Haley, who wasted no time praising his educator, Benny Mays, lavishing him with praise, who became later on Benny Mays, the symbol of Mohawk's excellence, and in his now wisdom and knowledge, written and unwritten, is preserved across generations. By doing what he did, he managed to preserve many May's wisdom, written and written across generations. And that is something we should all aspire to. Somehow, His Excellency was also the master of oral traditions, which made him the most African of all of us, as wonderful West Africans. In fact, this decade and century away from the motherland, he remained one of the most committed son of the land, one of the few tallest trees in the African forest of dignity, and he showed us how to be an American without renegating your African identity. And how, to as how aspiring to become a great American, as you all heard, and being proud of your African identity are not antithetical. Leadership to His Excellency was also generosity of his time. In 
Thank you, Model Doris, for making that possible. He spent countless hours mentoring future generations. From scores of those who have received this much from His Excellency, as we heard, much should be expected by those who will come after us. We now have to make sure that his amazing legacy and commitment to build and better generations, an inclusive world, transcends generations and inspire even more people in the coming decade and century. Just like His Excellency successfully immortalized many made visions of the world of globalizing excellence across America, we now have the responsibility to immortalize its continued relentless quest to build bridges across generations and to strengthen the bond between community on both sides of the Atlantic. He often said, to call it a house divided is a house conquered. That was his excellency. I stand before you this morning as one of the wounded warriors in our last latest battle against God's will. The silver lining of that preordained defeat is that I will be one of His Excellency's tremendous disciples, faithful disciples moving forward, working with others to make sure that His legacy live and endure and transcend the test of time. Embracing God's will with dignity and commitment, the prodigal sons who later became the tallest trees in the African forest of dignity is now with his ancestors. And will continue, I am sure, to look after us, his community and country from the motherland. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you. May God bless you. Good morning. Reverend Helton, members of Sasana Church. I am Dr. Charles Epps, and it is an honor that the family asked me to make remarks celebrating the life and legacy of the late Honorable George Wilford Boys Haley. Today we pause to express our sorrow and condolences to his widow Doris, his children David and Anne, son-in-law Wren, seven grandchildren, and many relatives, friends, and associates. We, are, we were fortunate to meet George and his family shortly after they moved to Washington, D.C. in 1969 when George served as Chief Counsel for Urban Mass Transportation. Since their arrival, our families have remained close. George and I became good friends. Doris and my late wife, Rosalind, were also close friends and club members in several organizations. Anne and our daughter, Rosalind, were high school and college classmates, and my sons were known to attend David's parties. <laughs> George remained in government service and practiced law for several years, 
culminating in his appointment as U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of the Gambia. During this assignment, my late wife, Rosalind, and I visited the Haleys. The people of the Gambia endured the U.S. Ambassador and Ambassador Doris. George and Doris represented the United States well and were held in highest regard. For example, during our visit, the four of us traveled to a small village for a traditional solemn naming ceremony. The infant's boy was named for George. He accepted the Gambian's respect and grace with great appreciation. One organization that George particularly enjoyed was membership in Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity, also known as the Boule. Sigma Pi Phi is the first Greek letter fraternity founded by African American men in 1904. Boule members are selected on the basis of education, accomplishment, fellowship, and service to fellow citizens. In 1977, George became a member of Epsilon Boule, the Washington, D.C. chapter. George was a faithful member for many years. And though he lived in Silver Spring, Maryland, Archon Haley insisted upon driving me to monthly meetings in D.C. Later, fellow Archon Hippolyte Fofak drove us both to evening <laughs> meetings. <laughs> this was convenient because Hippolyte lived north of Silver Spring, and George and I lived on the way. <laughs> Lately, uh, Archon Hippolyte um, was promoted to position in Cairo, Egypt, and as you have seen, he's traveled here for this service. This demonstrates the affection for George amongst those who knew him. Additionally, George assisted Dr. Samuel P. Massey and Dr. George Jones in organizing the Boule chapter in suburban Maryland. George enjoyed the camaraderie of Boule members, and the brothers enjoyed his contributions and presence. George was a gentleman in every sense of the word. He was studious and soft-spoken. To know him was to love him and respect him. May Almighty God grant George eternal peace and rest, and may his family derive some measure of comfort in the knowledge that we all share their grief. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for being here today. <laughs> I'm Evan, I'm the eldest grandchild, so today I'll be trying to speak <laughs> on behalf of my cousins and siblings um, in honor of our beloved grandpapa, which is what we called him. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm so emotionally full. <laughs> Sorry. It's such a blessing to be able to say that your own grandfather is the kindest person you've ever known. 
and likely ever will. <laughs> um, he, just such a sweet man. And I just want to give a few anecdotes about growing up with him as a grandfather. Um, firstly, uh, just a quick memory is that every time I visited my grandparents in Silver Spring and I, was, I came to the house, Grandpapa, he knew that my favorite fruits were honeydew and blueberries. And it seems trivial, but um, every time I came there, if he didn't already have them in the refrigerator, he would immediately go to the grocery store and get exactly what his grandchildren wanted to eat while they were visiting. Um, so that thoughtfulness is something that I really carry with me. And another quick thought is that I think we can all attest to this. He loved to talk to people. He loved to, you know, spend time uh, and share stories with people and things like that. But as a little kid, that's kind of tedious sometimes. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember being younger and just, you know, pulling at his pant leg and being like, Grandpa, but can we please go? Come on. We've, we've been here for two hours. Um, but the reason I say that is because the beauty of, of the passage of time and of growth is that now I understand. And I understand that it, it was his humanity and his love of other people that is what compelled him to speak to people so freely and so constantly and at length. I, I used to never understand how he could have so much to say to so many people. I was like, wow, they must be really, everyone's interesting, I guess. <laughs> um, but, but with my maturation and just getting to know him more, it it's really proves how much he just loved being around all of you and anyone he encountered. Um, and so that, I obviously he's had many accomplishments work-wise and things like that, but I feel like his humanity is truly his greatest one. Um, and that's something that I definitely, he always was so proud to brag about, uh, about us, so I'm pleased to do so today. But um, that's definitely something that I want to keep that legacy going. So I'm just happy to be here. Thank you all for being here, and we love him very much. family. I count all of you family. I guess that is the dream come true when your daughter and children are the tough acts to follow. Uh, <laughs> and um, in this case, I have a tough act to follow in, in my parents and my brother and I do it. And I'm not going to linger because I was not sure I would even be able to stand here before you. And we're so pleased um, to see all of you. And of course, this is a testament to our father. And because I did not know what I would be capable of, what I thought I would do and did, was to write and decide to share with you a letter to my daddy. Dear daddy, look at me. I wasn't at all sure I was going to have the fortitude to stand here today, not on this day. I shouldn't be surprised though because the greater surprise to me over the past three months has been how I was able to watch your intermittent struggle with health and with life and not just curl up in the fetal position in a corner somewhere. You, my first love, my ever beloved, me, your daddy's girl. But through God's grace, and this is a true testimony, I did, and I will do it today. Though I thought it's safer to craft this letter to you, to share with those gathered here in your honor, than to risk winging it. So what shall I tell them, daddy? Shall I share with them how our love was is symbiotic? How when I was little, so connected were we that when I got sick, you got sick. <laughs> when I was anxious, not even in your presence, you felt it and were anxious too. Oh, my overprotective worry wart of a daddy. One who should know such things once told me that your early mother loss probably contributed to your arguably hyper-attentive concern over me. <laughs> I never minded it, it just felt like love. Shall I tell them that it was in part your off-spoken longing to be reunited, reunited with your long-missed mama that gave me comfort at the end? That I even whispered in your ear what I hoped were the encouraging words that she was waiting for you? 
that I even convinced myself that I, little Bertha, as you and my uncles called me for the way I reminded you all of her, was actually passing directly out of my arms and into hers. I will tell them how in your last days the fact that you and I could read each other's minds assisted us when you could no longer form words, and that I saw your tensed brow actually relax when I reminded you of that fact. Daddy, you don't have to struggle. You know I know exactly what you're trying to say. I will tell them of how proud I've always been of you, not just for all of your countless awards and honors and pioneering acts and selfless accomplishments, but for the way you drew people to you. How I would just bask in the glow of watching people hang on to your every word. Was it your words or was it your heart? I never minded sharing you. One should not be selfish about the kind of spirit with which you were blessed and you clearly had enough to go around. Thank you for enlarging our family by your love. And speaking of family, our team, we four, let me just tell you, Daddy, how proud I am of Mommy and David. You know you married a strong woman almost 61 years ago, and she has always been a warrior, but oh, Daddy, you should see her now. <laughs> Um, I know you know, though, in every one of our last telephone conversations, when I would call you from Los Angeles, you would say, your mama is taking such good care of me. I have never been more appreciative of her strength or her love for you than now. You want to read it? Look. And this best of all big brothers of mine, <laughs> did you see how he enveloped mommy and me in a protective embrace as we stood there? united with you as you made your transition. I know you did. And you remember I told you that I would remind him of how proud you are of him. Show him again that door in your office that is covered in newspaper articles and pictures and awards marking his accomplishments. And I whispered to you, one of my last whispers to you, was that I would take care of them. Was that when you felt it safe to go? I'll just tell them that I have never seen a better father a better, more generous man, and how thankful I am that you were mine. And then, because you and I loved it so, because it was our song, the song you sang to get me to sleep, the song to which you gave me away in marriage, and the song I sang to you daily when you could no longer accompany me, I will sing. Now, this was a bold attempt. <laughs> but I have to do a little bit of it, because this is our song. Embrace me. My sweet embraceable you, embrace me, my irreplaceable you. Just one look at you, my heart grows tipsy in me. You and you alone bring out the gypsy in me. I love all. That was his part those many charms about you. Above all, I want my arms about you. Don't be a naughty baby. Come to Papa, come to Papa do. My sweet embraceable you. Ann Haley, ladies and gentlemen, Ann Haley. <laughs> First, give an honor to God, who brought us all a mighty long way. God of our weary years and God of our silence. My fear. To my mother, my sister, to my children, my nieces, my nephews beloved brother-in-law, my other brothers here, Jim, Bob, Hippolyte, Peter, I know I shouldn't start calling out because I'm going to miss one. 
What a fellowship. What a joy. Divine. My family is here, my cousins, cousins-in-laws, my aunt, my uncle. Our family is here, those that you have heard from and those that you have yet to hear from have gathered far and from far and near to be here. Mama said, David, don't be long. <laughs> and she told me again. And that's fortunate, Mom, because much of what I wanted to say has been said. I won't reiterate, but on behalf of this family, I want to sincerely say the outpouring of love and support for George Williford Forrest Haley is a little bit, almost, uh, it's almost incomprehensible. The gratitude from our family, Brother Rodney, I've got one of my brothers, Rodney, because he had spoken so eloquently. The sharing at this time is appreciated in a way that I could never, we could never express. The pastor into this church, he loved Israel. All the time, he loved this church home and to this church family. And so I will be brief, because all we really have to say is thank you. You know, we have a measured amount of time here. Everyone here knows that. And what our character and the time that we do with the dash in between birth and death and what it speaks for at that hour is the measure of personhood. See, I like to think that in wherever our times are, in our times, and in our place, that with God's grace, each of us can make a difference to embrace the brotherhood of man, which presupposes that we are all kin. Because his dad used to like to say, how can we say we love God, whom we really haven't seen, but don't care for and nurture and involve ourselves in and strengthen our fellow man and our fellow women, whom we have seen. So in his time and in his place, I believe in, with the words we've heard today, that with God's grace, dad really did make a difference. That this fellowship and the resonance of it, not only here, but beyond, speaks to that dash. You know, he uh, took on a lot of, of different things. He you know, I was fortunate to have him for, uh, for a father, but like many of you, the, the best thing about George Haley, at least for me, was that he was really a friend. He was just, he was my friend. He was the best, best man in my wedding. He was, he was my friend. He, 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 was, he was the guy that after working all week, I had a paper route and, you know, in the neighborhood in Lay Hill Village and, and around, and, on Sunday, he'd get up and help me roll the heavy Sunday papers and put them in the back of the station wagon in the early Sunday morning, drive me around. He was, he, he was a friend. Never did realize when I ran into, uh, ran through the light at Carter Barron and hit that Porsche. <laughs> How did my friend, I mean, it just, you know. <laughs> And so, some of you have that testimony, too, about George Haley. If you ever met him, I want you to know, we want you to know, family, we want you to know that he really was not only curious about what you wanted to do, he was behind you, 100%. He believed in you. He knew you could do what you wanted to do. He's excited about it. You wanted to hear about it. He wanted to know how he could help you. If you ever met him and you ever talked with him about it, he was glad that you all were together in this project. Mm -hmm. You could get it done. You 
were the greatest person and the most inspirational that George Haley had met. He was your friend. And at this hour, this is what I'm hoping that we can engender one and to each other. If you don't know someone in here who came out to say, uh, to give their respects to the family, please do George Haley and do Doris and David and Ann a favor. Meet somebody that's here. Interact with them. Carry the spirit on, if you will. In your time and in your space, with, with God's grace, we too, let's make that difference talk about all the hostilities out in the world today. We, in the far distance, can hear the cry of a siren. But we have, through what has been the kindred spirit that I think flows from breast to breast, the spirit that dad really did try to live every day of his life, wherever he found himself. He wouldn't quit doing it. That man wouldn't quit doing it. And at this point in time, blessed as we are, I hope that we'll continue it too. Let me say that in Kansas City where I am, they, they, there was an honor the other day they gave him. He had many awards. He was excited about getting one that was coming up. And it's an old baseball field. And the baseball field is going to be renamed the George and Doris Haley baseball field. <laughs> if you were to drive past it today and look out, and it's just an old field where kids used to play. It needs a lot of work. It's going to be done, but they plan where the lights will be in the grandstands. And I've gotten so when I drive up and down the street, it's on a street called Parallel. I've already started saying, looking at that old field, but that has great potential, there's George Haley. <laughs> when I drive up and down the street. I drive up and down the street and I say, there's George Haley because I see something that has potential and that that potential is going to be realized and that we just have to keep working with it a little bit, but that in that potential, there's going to be a better, brighter day where Young people will learn and grow and play and be happy and make a contribution back. There goes George Haley. In your time, and in your space, in this place, with God's grace, we determined to find that kindred spirit. That there goes George Haley in you so that you too can make that difference. God bless you. Good morning, afternoon. Numerous condolences and words of comfort have been sent to the family, and I will just acknowledge a few as they will be passed on to the family to read at their leisure. Bishop William H. Graves, past senior bishop of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Carter Tabernacle, CME Church, Orlando, Florida. Reverend Dr. James Morris, pastor. Reed Temple AME Church, uh, Glendale, Maryland, Reverend Dr. Lee P. Washington, Pastor. Friends of Yates Incorporated, Kansas City, Ramita Petro, Executive Director. Shallow Baptist Church, Washington, D.C., Wallace Smith, Senior Pastor. Reverend Kevin J. Agee, Presiding Elder and the Washington, Virginia District of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. I would like to just highlight a few of the acknowledgments. The State of Kansas House of Representatives, Roderick A. Houston, representative of the, 20, of the 99th District, to the family of Senator George Haley, 
on behalf of the members of the Kansas African American Legislative Caucus, we extend our deepest condolences on the passing of former Kansas State Senator George Haley. He was a strong leader and will be remembered as a man who dedicated his life to helping break down racial barriers and rectifying injustices that plagued this nation and for paving the way for the next generation of African American leaders who would come behind him, enabling them to become relevant public servants on every level. To Mrs. Doris Haley, Senator David Haley, and Mrs. Ann Haley Brown, it is our pleasure, our prayer, that you will be comforted by the loving memories of this great man and find peace in knowing that the world is a better place because of the efforts of George W. Haley. Sincerely, the Kansas African American Legislative Caucus. The State of Kansas, the Senate Chamber, Office of the Democratic Leader, Senator David Haley. Dear Senator Haley, the Senate Democrats are deeply saddened to hear about the loss of your father, George. On behalf of the members of the Kansas Senate Democratic Caucus, please accept our heartfelt condolences at this difficult time and know that you and your family are in our prayers and our thoughts, our deepest sympathy, and it's signed by each of the members. State Senator David Haley from the State of Indiana House of Representatives. It is with great remorse that I heard of your loss. The fine citizens of the 94th House District of Indiana join me in extending heartfelt sympathy. Ambassador George Haley, who is no longer with you in the flesh, will be missed, but find comfort in knowing that God can ease your burdens and give you everlasting strength. Earth hath no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Remember the good times and thank God for them. Pleasant memories are forever and they will remain a part of your heart always. My prayers are with you, respectively. Sherris H. Pry S. Pryor, State Representative, House District 94. Israel Metropolitan Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, Board of Stewards Resolution. Ambassador George Williford Boyce Haley was the eminent expression of friendship. Lives once touched by him became tuned and are there ever amiable, kindly, and fraternal. He was in fact the College of Friendship and the University of Brotherly Love. He was the Dean of the School for the Better Making of Men and Women. Ambassador Haley's courage of character did, uh, did not allow him to remain silent in the face of injustice to anyone. He chose to light candles rather than curse the darkness. He viewed life's obstacles as challenges. Ambassador Haley's only weapon against lies was the uncompromising truth. This is the essence of God's faithful servant. We, the Board of Stewards at Israel Metropolitan Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, therefore pause in time on this 22nd day of May, 2015, to acknowledge the home going of one of God's exceptional servants. Be it therefore resolved that we remember and celebrate on this day the life of a man who let his work, his life, and his service speak for him. The Board of Stewards, Officers, Clergy, and the Congregants of Israel Metropolitan Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, the 7th Episcopal District, and the entire CME Connection, as well as the world at large, is stronger and better due to his efforts, and we are all greater servants for having had the opportunity to have known and served with him. Be it lastly resolved for the entire Haley family Mrs. Doris Haley, his beloved wife of 60 years, his son, Mr. David Haley, his daughter, Ms. Ann Haley Brown, and his grandchildren, other family members, and his numerous friends. Each of you individually and collectively will remain constant in our prayers, and a copy of this resolution will be provided to the Haley family. Respectively submitted, Spooner C. Underwood Chair Board of Stewards, 
Dr. Ricky D. Helton, senior pastor. Israel Metropolitan Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Life is but a stopping place, a pause in what's to be, a resting place along the road to sweet eternity. On Wednesday, May 13, 2015, the mighty God called to Ambassador George Williford Boyce Haley, come home to sweet eternity. Ambassador Haley was faithful as a husband to his wife Doris for nearly 61 years, a devoted father and a loving grandfather to his seven grandchildren. He was a friend to many and a servant of his savior whose faith was immovable. And now his journey has finally ended. He'll claim a great reward and find an everlasting peace together with his Lord. Amb Ambassador Haley was introduced to many of us through the mini series and the book Roots, the Saga of American Family. We learned that his roots began in Africa, a country on the west, a country on the west coast, and he was later appointed to serve as ambassador to the Republic of Gambia. His family in America was rooted in the fiber and fabric of the colored Methodist Episcopal Church. His parents met on the campus of Lane College in Tennessee. He served for many years as a faithful member of St. Peter's CME Church in Kansas. He united with Israel Metropolitan Christian Methodist Church, Episcopal Church in the early 90s under the pastorate of Reverend Willie Owens. He became active in the life and witness of the church and was appointed to serve on the steward board, a position he held for many years. He was named stewardess Stuart Emeritus. He was a faithful member of the church, regularly worshiping at the 7.45 a.m. worship service. Ambassador Haley loved the members of the church, and they loved him. He always greeted members with a hearty handshake, a cheery smile, and words of encouragement. He was a diplomat, an attorney, and a policy expert having ser served under seven presidential administrators. While his sojourn on earth has ended, the journey of faithful service has led him to be home with God. We all have different journeys, different paths along the way. We all are meant to learn and do some things, but we were never meant to stay. Our destination is a place far greater than we know. Ambassador George Haley is now in that greater place together with his Lord. To his wife Doris, his son David, his daughter Anne, grandchildren, other relatives and friends, the Israel Church family offers its sincere and heartfelt condolences. May your faith in God give you strength to bear the loss of your loved one who has see, received rest and life eternal. He's now safe at home with God. May God's grace and love sustain you. Done this 22nd day of May, 2015, by the order of the pastor, officers, and members of Israel Metropolitan Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, Reverend Dr. Ricky D. Helton, pastor, Spooner Underwood, Jr., Chair Board of Stewards, Clarence P. Carter, Jr., Chair Board of Trustees, Reverend Carol Richardson, church historian. May God bless you. Thank you. 
Oh. 
church say a hearty amen. 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 Brother Haley would be so proud of this moment right now. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for what has been said thus far. We thank you for a life well lived, an example of humanity at its highest. Thank you for this life. Thank you for his legacy. Thank you for this family. And thank you for the sacred time and moment in history. Transform it now. The memory banks of all of our lives forever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Permit me briefly to read a portion of scripture from St. John chapter 19, just one verse, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. From 2 Timothy chapter 4, from the New International Version, it reads, as I would like to have it read today, verse 6, 2 Timothy. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is stored for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I want to use today as a subject matter a topic it is finished. Colon. From a man who wouldn't quit. It is finished. This eulogy today is about a man who would not quit. It is about a man who completed his course in life and finished his race very well. I could not help but make an extreme analogy today about George Haley that some may say, Pastor, you may be going a bit too far, but allow me to have pastoral privilege and say that I don't think so. <laughs> to me, George Haley represented a Christ-like figure. See, George and I became very close. So close that I believe that it qualifies me to make such a bold and affirmative statement. From the countless hours that we spent fellowshipping together in multiple settings, I feel that my testimony is not far-fetched. We were as close as a pastor can become to a member. And that is something after 34 years of ministry, I can hardly say too often. Only a handful of times can I say that. Let's examine the biblical text a little more closely in John 19.30. Jesus said that it is finished. Note carefully what Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say that I am finished. Jesus said that it is finished. I want to examine the it today. What was the it? The it was 
his work. He had completed the work that was assigned to him. And note now, who was assigned, who was, who had, uh, assigned him the work? It was assigned to him by his father. All throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, he sought to fulfill the earthly mission of his father's expectation of him by helping the downtrodden and the oppressed all the way to the cross. Jesus fulfilled his purpose for ministry as cited in Luke chapter 4 verse 18. He stated that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me and I quote, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those and them that are bruised. I find this strikingly similar to, similar to what George said about his purpose at a bar association gathering where he was being honored as a hero in law. Listen to what George said about himself. He would like to change the title of his award from a hero in law to a hero of justice. George went on to tell all of the attorneys who were present to seek justice above all He stated that heroism is the jurisdiction of those who do, not, who do not mortgage their backbone to curry favor or undue privilege. He further remarked that lawyers, because of their prominent place in society, have an obligation to redress injustice and give back to those less fortunate. He went even further to say this. If you distill but one theme from all that I have said today, let it be this, that the recognition that the expansion of justice must be the goal we strive to attain. In the quote he says, it will be the main piston driving human history in the third millennium. It takes little imagination to figure out that justice was what Ambassador Haley was seeking in life, and even a lesser imagination to know that Jesus stood for justice his entire life, all the way to the cross. Jesus finished his work. Ambassador George Williford, Boyce Haley, finished his work as well. He fulfilled his earthly father's Simon mission for him by pursuing a degree from Kansas Law School amid a racist and cruel environment to help the downtrodden, which became evident right after he finished law school through his help with Brown versus Board of Education. As the Apostle Paul stated in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, I have poured out my life like a drink offering, and my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Brother George poured out his life as an offering to humanity, Sister Doris, David, and Ann. His many years as a public servant is a matter of public record. Just Google his name and you'll see for yourself. His tenacity to not quit was earned as a young black man in the rural South. Like Jesus, he had a father who encouraged him to persevere, persevere against all odds in the midst of a society 
who wanted him to fail. Like Paul, he kept the faith and would not quit. He continued to pour out his life as a public servant and as, as a committed church member here at Israel Metropolitan CME Church. You see, Brother Haley hardly ever missed a church service. He would be here every Sunday for our first service if he were in town. And he took notes. He took notes of every service. The same notes that earned him top honors in law school. He took copious notes of all of my messages and showed them to me after each service. <laughs> Look, Reverend Helton, three or four pages this Sunday. He was an excellent listener. Something that most of us, if not all of us, do not know. Brother Haley wrote a recommendation for my daughter to get a job in the federal government in 2009 while she was a junior in high school to begin her career with the federal government, which she kept for five summers. That same daughter that he wrote a recommendation for finished college last Friday. Brother George introduced me to many of his friends in various levels of government. In an Africare function, I personally saw how much George loved Africa, and namely his birthplace in the Gambia, where he served as an ambassador of the United States of America. On the day after his stroke, Brother George had arranged for a professional chauffeur to pick my wife and I up from our house for a special event where he was being honored in Baltimore through the Cal Ripken Foundation. This was one of many such occasions. Three months ago, Brother George called me and said, Pastor, it's time for you and I to go to lunch. I drove to his home in February. He gave me a royal tour of his house and a personal history lesson of his entire life. Over two and a half hours we spent there. Afterwards, we went out to his favorite restaurant, Boston Market. <laughs> <laughs> Which he showed me everything on the menu and said, get what you want, Pastor. This is our day. <laughs> you see, I love Brother Haley as a father. Everything that has been said today has been said in truth. So I would like to say this to his family today. Brother Haley poured out his life to all of humanity. He finished his work. He did not finish himself. He finished his work. I believe that he is in a better place today as a result of his work on earth. Amen. He lives on in another realm. Amen. The question remains for us all today, will we finish our work Amen. or will we quit in adversity? George has blazed a trail for all of us to follow. He carried a torch for a long time. His family showed us the value of knowing our roots. Let's build upon this rich legacy that he has left and his family has left for us. I want to end this message today with, jo with George's final words of his speech to his fellows, fellow attorneys. And I quote, Thus here I stand before you, not so much of a hero, but the product, hyphen, the product of heroic struggles. Here I am, the United States ambassador to the Gambia. I went to the Gambia voluntarily, 
nine generations ago, Kuta Kente had no choice. He left the Gambia imprisoned in a bleak hold of a slave ship. A familial cycle has been completed, George says. Kunta must be smiling to know that now I have returned as an ambassador. 200 years ago, slavery was Kunta's lot. Brother Haley and the Haley family today completes that cycle. As George stated, Kunta's smile is now broader and the cycle is now complete. To the Haley family, keep smiling along with Kunta. And we shall all be smiling with you. Keep pursuing justice and finish well like George and never, ever quit. Right. Amen. Amen. Funeral Home would like to make an announcement at this time regarding the procession to the cemetery. all. As this service is about to conclude, we are going to process immediately to the cemetery. We ask that you allow the family to please get in their car as we are under a tight schedule to get to the cemetery for honors and for the rest of the day to go on. For those of you that plan to be in the procession, be sure that you have an orange funeral tag. We are going to process on Randolph to Georgia. Wherever you are parked, if you just get yourself to Georgia Avenue, you will be able to get in the procession. In the event that you do not want to process with us, please just go straight up Georgia Avenue above Aspen Hill to one. as we recess out. If there are any ladies who would like to help with any of the flowers, you may do so now.
Yeah.